Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the first of seven Sunday services during this coming summer session. And to all of you fathers, happy Father's Day. Today is our day. However, in my household, the better half, my partner, Shirley, always reminds me that, that the other 364 days in the year is her days. So, but of course, I'm kidding. She gives me at least one day a month. But I did a little research on the origins of Father's Day and found out that Mother's Day was first celebrated and recognized in 1914, and it took the nation 52 years to formally acknowledge Father's Day when President Lyndon Johnson in 1966 issued the first presidential proclamation to honor fathers. Congress had previously denied recognizing Father's Day, citing that this was just a ploy by the retailers to sell more pro products to the public. However, Congress finally agreed in 1972 to honoring Father's Day as a national holiday on the third Sunday of June after hearing from millions of fathers who just were screaming and saying, please, Congress, just give us one day away from our wives and our kids. So, but seriously, the real reason we celebrate Father's Day is to honor those deserving men for their commitment to their family and the welfare of their country. Now, this morning when I came in, Grace Hatano, Sensei Grace, had told me, or rather ordered me, to give a little bio of myself. So I'm just going to give you a, a brief bio of, of me. I was born on December 27, 1953, and in, in Tracy, California, but I grew up in Sacramento. And during the uh, kindergarten year was my first year, so back in the early 60s, I attended the Sacramento Buddhist Church right here. And after I graduated from high school, which was McClatchy High School, I went on to Sacramento State. I went there for four years and graduated with an accounting degree and then went on with my career. And the best thing to happen to me was that I married my wife, Shirley, on December 4th, 1980. See, I remembered Shirley. Oh, October 4th. I, I blew it. I blew it. October 4th, 1980. And I did not return to the Sacramento Buddhist Church until our first son, Jeff, who was born in 1983, um, was about two or three years old and enrolled in pre-kindergarten. So since that time, say 1986 until now, I've been involved with the church. I, I retired from state service after 36 years, retiring in December 2000. 11 and then six months later I became to my surprise a minister's assistant with the Sacramento Buddhist Church which is which was totally an honor for me and a privilege and all of my buddies had asked me after I became a minister's assistant like why did you do that what are you doing are you crazy and I told them well yeah I might be crazy but in all seriousness for me since I was entering hopefully the last third of my life that I needed some sort of direction during my retirement as, as far as how to live. And during these last two and a half years through continuing education at the Jodo Shinshu Center in Berkeley and also uh, learning various things from my, my counterparts here, the MAs and also Reverends Bob and Patty Oshita, uh, I have grown a greater appreciation for life, a different perspective on life. It's given me more meaning as far as a deeper appreciation for my family and my friends and just people in general, knowing, the, knowing how difficult life really is when you really think about it. And so that's just a brief bile on my part. And now what I will do is get into my Dharma message for today. It is about a story that first came out 53 years ago 
1962 when I was a second grader. It was about a Professor Fowler who was in his early 70s who taught poetry at the Rock Spring School for Boys. One afternoon, the professor was summoned to the headmaster's office to discuss his future at the school. Because of the time devoted to giving final exams, grading papers, and getting ready for the upcoming Christmas New Year holiday, which marked the end of another school year, the professor did not really know the real purpose for the meeting. He had assumed that the meeting was to go over the signing of a new contract for another year. However, much to the professor's surprise, the headmaster informed the professor that his employment with the school would be terminated. Instead of continuing to teach at the school where he taught for over 50 years, the professor was suddenly, suddenly staring at retirement. In a dazed and confused state at his home, he pulled out the past school yearbooks and quietly reminisced about his years at the school. With the unexpected end of his employment, the professor sadly came to the conclusion that he was useless now, a complete and utter failure, giving his students nothing but meaningless gibberish, moved and motivated no one, and left no imprint on society. Upon these realizations, he unlocked his desk drawer and picked up his revolver. He then wandered out to the school cemetery. As he pointed the revolver to his head, the professor stared at the tombstone of one of the most respected and revered educators of that school. On that tombstone read the following, be ashamed to die until you have won a victory for humanity. The professor lamented, quote, I have won no victories, and now I am ashamed to die, unquote. As the professor was about to pull the trigger, out of the clear blue night, the school bell started ringing. Startled and curious, he made his way back to his classroom to find out what was going on. In the dark, empty classroom, the professor saw a strange light and the images of seven young men appeared sitting in the desks. With a look of fascination, the professor spoke. Boys, please forgive me, but what are you doing here? One by one, each of the boys stepped forward to introduce himself. The first young man, Bartlett, sir, class of 1939. I died in Roanoke, Virginia, conducting research in x-rays and was exposed to radiation, which resulted in my contracting leukemia. I remember what you said, Professor, a quote from the poet Walter, as I continued to battle this disease while conducting research. I would be true, for there are those who trust me. I would be pure, for there are those who care. I would be strong, for there is much to suffer. And I would be brave, for there is much to dare. This is what you taught me, Professor, and I have never forgotten that. Next, the second young man. Beechcroft, sir, class of 1941. I was killed at Iwo Jima in 1945 and was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. This medal partly belongs to you, sir, as I learned what courage was from you. Next, the third young man. Why, sir, class of 1915. I was the first to die as I died on the battleship Arizona at Pearl Harbor. You were at my elbow that day. Something you taught me which pushed me towards trying to save my fellow sailors from an exploding boiler room. It was a poem by John Donne. Any man's death diminishes me, 
because I am involved with mankind, and therefore I never seem to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for me. In other words, what this meant was, in life, we really don't know how much time we have to live, so we do all we can to help mankind. And when it is our time to die, there's nothing you can do about it. For the four, for the four next four young men, for the four young men, all of them had died in the war, but remembered before their deaths the lessons about patriotism, loyalty, ethics, honesty, and sacrifice from the professor. As their time in the classroom was coming to an end, these young men told the professor that they had to return to where they came from. However, the purpose of their visit was to tell their beloved professor how important he was in their lives and how they were privileged to have known him. Each, each student, in his own way, saying thank you for the precious lessons learned. As the professor fought back his tears, the school bell rang again. While gazing at his former students, they smiled back at the professor, bowed their heads, and quietly disappeared into the night. As the professor re-examined the past few moments, he concluded that during all those years of teaching, he had indeed given everything to his profession and his students and had left a positive mark on humanity. The professor now saw that it was not about public recognition or praise for his work, but what he did in a classroom to inspire and mold his students to face the future, for that was the essence of his being. The professor finally realized that he had indeed lived a very rewarding and rich life and now was ready to move on into retirement. As you can guess, this story did not happen in real life. However, I believe that inspiration for all of us comes in many forms, such as television, movies, the theater, and literature. All those forms imitating life in many different ways. In this story, the professor was looking for recognition and praise regarding his noble efforts for over 50 years to validate his existence. When we think about it, seeking acknowledgement and praise is a form of greed. When the professor did not receive the public recognition, he became disillusioned, disillusioned and suffered greatly for it, even to the point of attempting suicide. In Buddhism, we are taught that humans are flawed beings who suffer from many forms of greed, desires and wants, which typically result in anger, depression and madness. In truth, as it was for the professor, all of us have selfishly and perhaps cunningly performed acts of kindness with the calculated hopes of receiving recognition, praise, or even some sort of reward. Hopefully, the Buddha Dharma will continue to teach and inspire us to just simply perform an act of compassion without the thought of receiving anything. The pureness of our efforts to help others in and of itself should be reward enough. In closing, please join me in Gashō. As the golden chain states in part, quote, I will be kind and gentle to every living thing and protect all who are weaker than myself. I will think pure and beautiful thoughts, say pure and beautiful words, and do pure and beautiful deeds." Unquote. Words to live by so that we may aspire to attain perfect peace in order to live a life well lived. Namo Amidabas.
Namo Amidavits. Namo Amidavits. Namo Amidavits.